on the program today. Zimbabwe secures 193 million US dollars to improve its health sector. And Ghana accepts to join the Atlantic Basin Corporation. Plus, Royal Air Maroc announces plans to boost its route network. Hello and welcome to another exciting day of business in Africa. I'm Will Ebong. This is Business Incorporated. And as usual, let's check in on the market, starting with Africa, where we saw mostly positive sentiments at intraday. Nigeria's NGX was trading up 0.12% at intraday, while South Africa's GSC was up more than half a percent. Elsewhere, we saw Egypt's EGX30 recording triple digit gains at intraday. It was up 3.17% to close at 16,400. 11 points, while Kenya closed Tuesday session in the red. Now over to the Middle East, where we saw mixed sentiments at intraday. The Abu Dhabi index was marginally down 0.01%. Dubai, however, on the flip side, was up 0.48% to close at 3,400 points. Now still within the region, we saw Saudi Arabia up 0.07%, while the Qatari index closed almost 1% down. Now, EU members will soon be able to retaliate against countries it deems guilty of economic coercion. The plan, which has been provisionally approved, comes as geopolitical tensions increasingly spill over into trade. Now, to find out more about this, let's talk to Kate Ferguson in Berlin. Kate, this move seems to suggest that the EU is preempting further trade conflicts. How will this plan change its ability to respond? Well, this basically provides structure and formality where previously there was none. Up to this point, EU members have had to complain to the World Trade Organization whenever they felt they were being ill-treated by third parties. Now, that has often proven to be a far from satisfactory process, though, because it tends to be long and very bureaucratic as well. These new measures allow the EU itself to determine whether economic coercion has taken place and, should all other efforts at resolution fail, members could then impose trade restrictions in response. Now, this could mean things like increasing customs duties or restricting certain services, for example. The hope really is that this swifter response mechanism will act primarily as a deterrent. As one member of the European Parliament who was part of the negotiations put it, sometimes it's necessary to put a gun on the table, even if you know that it's not going to be used day by day. Now, this comes against an increasingly tense geopolitical backdrop. I hear you, Kate, we've seen Russia, Ukraine, we've seen other countries going neck to neck at this moment. But give us an idea of what led to this move. Yeah, so one very prominent recent example was what happened to Lithuania after it opened what was an all but name a Taiwanese embassy in its capital, Vilnius. This was back in 2021 and China responded with fury, blocking Lithuanian exports and pressuring countries to remove Lithuanian products from their supply chains. Now, the EU did lodge a complaint to the WTO about this, but so far nothing has happened with that. Under the new measures, though, Lithuania would be able to retaliate in kind. Now, memories of a difficult trade relationship with the last U.S. administration are also still quite raw in Europe. One example of what happened there was when the U.S. threatened to impose punitive tariffs on the EU if it implemented a digital tax that would hurt large U.S. corporations. Fundamentally, the aim really is to make sure the EU can respond quickly and effectively to countries seeking to use economics as a tool of coercion. OK, so what's going on in the European markets today? Well, we've been talking about the banks all week and investors do seem to be feeling a bit calmer now. We've seen some modest gains in Credit Suisse, UBS and Deutsche Bank. That message from central bankers and policymakers that the banks are safe is being received for now, but it would be wrong to think we're out of the woods entirely, given that there could be more interest rate hikes coming. Analysts are also making a lot out of the news of a major restructuring of Chinese tech giant Alibaba. Some think this is a sign that Beijing could be loosening its hold of the company, though I think it's too soon to be able to make a definitive statement of that kind. 
Thanks so much, Kate, for that update. Always good to have you on the program. Now, let's move over now to the UK, where Juliana is standing by with the latest updates from that region, starting off with matters regarding the spring budget. Good afternoon, Juliana. We see the UK Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, has hinted that the Treasury has not yet decided how much funding the Department of Health and Social Care will get to fund a pay deal for NHS workers. And, and he cited high inflation. I am just wondering if this won't further stoke strike actions. just don't know, uh, but it's likely. I think um, a lot of people have been concerned about the next move from the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, who, as you said, has this morning been speaking, or well, given evidence to the Treasury Select Committee about uh, the spring budget that he delivered on the 15th of March. And a big, big question uh, from uh, MPs across the House is, how are we going to fund the NHS? That has uh, been a, a huge burden uh, for the Conservative government, and it's something that the Labour opposition party really like to stoke um, uh, the flames for, because they know that the Conservative party, over the past few years, have chopped and changed uh, legislation, pulled money out, put money in, and it is a big concern, which is what has led uh, to uh, significant strikes. In fact, strikes that we hadn't seen in this country in over 100 years. At the moment, um, NHS workers are currently being balloted on the offer that was uh, provided to them by Steve Barclay, uh, the health minister. I believe there's a one-off payment ranging between about £2,000 to about £6,000, depending on uh, your level of service. And then I believe there's a 5% pay offer. Where is this money going to come from? That is the issue. And of course, as much as uh, Jeremy Hunt was a former health secretary, understands the issues in the NHS, He's still, of course, a politician and um, a, a very conservative one at that. He was brought into the job to make sure he could steady the markets. And he has maintained the role of being a safe pair of hands. Uh, so while we know that the NHS definitely does need uh, the billions of pounds in NHS uh, funding, we're not necessarily sure that Jeremy Hunt, uh, the Chancellor, is going to be providing that money without a push and a shove. And that is uh, basically uh, the evidence that he provided to the Treasury um, this morning. So we'll just have to wait and see if we have a statement later on today or later on the, uh, this week uh, by union bosses representing the NHS health workers. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you're going to keep us up to date on that, Juliana. But on the other hand, we saw UK high street chain Next saying it expects to raise its prices more slowly over the year uh, ahead. What are they basing this on? Yeah, this is quite interesting, actually. Next, a very popular retailer. If you're in the UK, you certainly would have heard uh, of them. They've got about 500 bricks and mortar stores across uh, the country, and they've been doing exceptionally well online. In fact, they were one of the only uh, retailers that did much better during the pandemic than they did beforehand. And I think a lot of economists in the UK, they use Next as a barometer uh, to really see how consumer confidence um, is going. And they've done well. They've um, um, announced better than expected um, year-to-date profits. I believe they're up about 5.7%. However, Next is a big faller on the UK Blue Chip Index today uh, because uh, their bosses are saying that they are actually going to have to raise prices much more than they were than they forecast last year. So I believe spring, summer, anyone shopping for clothes during that period, they'll see prices um, rising by about 7%. And I think in the autumn, about 3%. And this is up from a previous estimate of about 5 to 6%. And that's because we know that double digit inflation is not going away. We were told it was going away. And then we got that pretty surprising data from the Office for National Statistics last week showing that actually inflation is climbing higher. This obviously affects all walks of life. And that's why uh, Nexta Retailer has said this morning to investors that yes, they too are going to have to put up their prices so they can remain competitive. I was wondering when I saw that, I thought it was this inflation setting in, but I know that the numbers that came in last didn't show that. Uh, but it's good to always have you, Juliana. But it, the markets, before we go, let's see how the markets are doing. How are they doing better at today? 
Doing better. They're up um, in positive territory. The UK blue chip index, the all share is up 0.76%. The FTSE 100 is up by 0.84%. And the FTSE 250, the domestic market, that's up by 0.77%. In the currencies market, the British pound is currently trading down against the US dollar by 0.01%, down to against the euro by 0.10%. Uh, but the British pound is trading up against the Japanese yen at intraday by over 1%. Thank you. Will. Thanks a lot, Dina, for that update. Always bringing the facts behind the figures. Thank you, Juliana, and welcome back. Thank now you. over to other markets where Asia-Pacific markets were mostly higher on Wednesday as Alibaba's Hong Kong-listed shares spiked at the open after the Chinese tech giant announced it will split into six business groups. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index gained 2.06% and the Hang Seng Tech Index climbed 2.4%. Shares of Alibaba jumped. 13.7%. Now, in mainland China, the Shanghai Composite was down 0.16%, closing at 3,240 points, while the Shenzhen component rose 0.13%. Now, if we look at the um, Australia's S&P ASX 200, it rose 0.23% to close at 7,050 points, as its February Consumer Price Index rose 6.8% lower than expected. Now in Japan, the Nikkei 225 rose 1.33% to finish at 27,883 points, and the Topics Index rose 1.46% to end the day. South Korea's Kospi closed up 0.37% to close at 2,443 points. Now onto the U.S. where stock futures rose early on Wednesday after the major averages declined on the back of higher bond yields. The we saw the Dow Jones Industrial Average futures rising by 0.75%. S&P 500 and NASDAQ 100 futures climbed 0.87% and 0.91% each. The NASDAQ composite climbed down 0. Point, closed down rather 0.45% during the regular session on Tuesday, falling for a second straight day as rising yields weighed on tech stocks. The S&P 500 fell 0.16%, while the Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 37.83 points. Some investors are worried that higher interest rates could tip the economy into a recession, even as Wall Street tried to move past this month's regional banking crisis. The yield on the two-year U.S. Treasury note rose back above 4%, weighing on interest rate-sensitive tech stocks. Now, crude prices rose for a third day in early Asian trade on Wednesday as a halt to some experts from Iraqi Kurdistan raised concerns of tightening supply and market sentiments improved as fears of a banking crisis eased. Brent crude futures rose 42 cents to $79.07 .07 a barrel. West Texas Intermediate U.S. crude climbed 0.8% to $73.79 .79 a barrel. All prices have been rallying after Iraq was forced to halt exports of about 450,000 barrels per day from its northern Kurdistan region through Turkey after an arbitration decision confirmed Baghdad's consent was needed to ship the oil. Barclays said on Tuesday that any protracted outage of Kurdish exports through the end of the year would imply a $3 a barrel upside to the bank's $92 a barrel Brent price forecast for 2023. Also, Monday's announcement that First Citizens Bank shares will acquire deposits and loans of failed Silicon Valley Bank spurred optimism about the condition of the banking sector that has roiled financial markets. We saw a drawdown in U.S. crude oil inventories last week also lending support. Gold prices rose on Tuesday, drawing support from a weaker U.S. dollar, even as higher bond yields and easing worries about a full-blown banking crisis limited gains for the safe haven asset. Following two sessions of declines, spot gold gained 0.92%. U.S. gold futures settled 1.14% higher at 1,976. In the near term, gold prices could slip to 1,900. $33, but the outlook for gold remains bullish with fast approaching peak in U.S. rates and a danger of hitting a recession in coming months. Commodity, head of commodity strategy has said that. Now we saw spot silver gold 0.6% uh, to $23, $0.23 cents, um, rising up there. Platinum shed 0.7%. To $965.19, while palladium was up 1%. Welcome back. Now, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, has approved 
uh, uh, $80.77 million under the food shock window of the Rapid Credit Facility to help Burkina Faso address urgent balance of payment needs related to the global food crisis. Now about 16% of the country's population is in acute food insecurity conditions. Food insecurity is at the front burner here in Burkina Faso and Dr. Lassan Widrago, research fellow at the Center for Democracy and uh, Dep Development in Abuja joins us via Zoom to unpack the current situation facing the country. Good afternoon, doctor. It's good to have you on the program. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to join you on this program. Uh, doctor, can you just paint a picture here? How bad is this shock? Well, one of the things to consider is that uh, annual food import for Burkina Faso is roughly 400 to 500 million dollars a year. And, and the government is compelled to divert resources into the fight against terrorism over the past seven years. So consequently, other sectors were going to be uh, negatively impacted. Along with that, we have the international situation with the COVID-19, the, the conflict in Ukraine, all contributing to complicating things. So it is reasonable um, to speculate that our food import bill has increased dramatically. So it has become vital for government to look into international partners such as IMF for relief. Um, so, and if you're looking at the situation on the ground, I would say it's pretty bad. Uh, we have about 4 million people who are internally displaced. That is huge. Um, and most of the people who are internally displaced are farmers who are compelled to run away from the farms, to run away from the cattle, the crops, and uh, to swell our small cities. So, and these are the people who are actually providing, uh, producing and providing food on our tables. And uh, with this kind of situation going on, it's vital to look into um, this kind of a, a relief program or credit program that uh, could sustain um, uh, any possible economic recovery. Oh, well, if a Away from that, we're looking at the security concerns that you've mentioned that has driven farmers from the farm and they're not able to put produce for people, to provide food for the citizens right now. But what were some of the concerns, the requirements from the IMF that Burkina Faso had to meet to qualify for this credit facility? Now we're talking about transparency and governance here. Absolutely. Uh, we know this is a, a military transitional government. But uh, recently, Burkina Faso is showing good signs in its efforts to mobilize domestic revenues to ensure priority public expenditure and public debt sustainability. And one of the ways that is done um, transparently is uh, uh, the transitional leaders' keen interest in fighting against corruption, in seeking to reduce the expenses of public administration, so I believe this might have contributed to motivate IMF to agree into, uh, uh, into uh, giving this loan. But if you look at uh, IMF own documents uh, related to this loan, it's clearly specified that the financing terms of this loan is, uh, is the same as any other emergency financing program that IMF has. So, uh, um, access to this type of a rapid credit facility loan would be uh, attributed to low-income countries at uh, a, a concessional poverty reduction and growth facility terms, and the loan would be repaid within three to five years or within five to 10 years. But when it comes to the specificities of Burkina Faso, uh, the documents that I, I consulted uh, in my research does not really transpire any uh, details beyond those gross terms. So how is the funding, you mentioned, they mentioned, you know, helping it. I mean, the loan is gonna help with the balance of payments. How is this fund going to help with that? 
you, you talked about the more of importing food items into the country because the farmers are unable to, you know, farm. And this has caused, you know, that food insecurity that we are seeing now, the spike in food insecurity in the country. So how is this fund going to help, you know, balance this, the, the fund, I mean, the balance of payments? Well, I, I believe that uh, primarily this fund is going to uh, to be key uh, to be a key defense in addressing urgent balance of payments um, for for the country, and I think it's primarily going to go and contributing to alleviate our humanitarian situation on the ground. This is not money that is going to be utilized to just balance our payments and not be used uh, toward. Um, alleviating uh, the crisis on the ground. And, and it, it's, it's important to recall that the country is undergoing an unprecedented crisis in its history. Since 2016, when uh, we first experienced terrorist attacks, the security situation has grown extremely, extremely worse, so much that uh, when government wants to uh, provide resources to some of the uh, remote areas where uh, 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 jihadist terrorists are, are controlling, it takes them so many year, days, it takes them uh, approximately a month to be able to reach some, some place that would normally take uh, uh, four hours or six hours to drive there because there's a lot of uh, mine uh, on, the, on the road. So, and oftentimes they have to airlift uh, food items to, to those places. So it costs them more money and more resources to be able to, uh, when even when food is available, to, to, to distribute or to, to bring them to, to the people on the ground. So that is where I believe this fund is going to contribute, is going to help in mitigating um, the, the, the efforts to, uh, to address the situation. Thanks so much, Dr. Lassan Wadrigo. We do hope the situation in Burkina Faso is overcome very quickly. Dr. Lassan Wadrigo, Research Fellow, Center for Democracy and Development in Abuja. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Now to other stories where Zimbabwe is set to raise 193 million US dollars in offshore lending to implement a 2019 agreement with UK infrastructure company and MS for the construction of hospitals and clinics in the country. APSA and Standard Banks of South Africa are the joint arrangers for the transaction which will be insured by Export Credit Insurance Corporation of South Africa. The initial phases of the project, which also include four other hospitals, have been funded by the Zimbabwean government for 25 million US dollars, while the next phase, which is to build five 80-bed district hospitals and 30 20-bed clinics, will be completed by the NMS. However, the balance of the project will now be funded by the ECA-backed structured finance package. Now, Ghana's president, Mr. Nana Akufo-Addo, has accepted the invitation of the United States to join the Atlantic Corporation as a founding member. The Atlantic Corporation, an initiative of the United States, aims to foster a peaceful, prosperous, open and cooperative Atlantic region and to build shared capacity, innovative technologies and best practices developed by the Atlantic nations to preserve the water body as a healthy, sustainable and resilient resource for future generations. Members of the community include the United States, Angola, Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Costa Rica, Cote d'Ivoire, Equatorial Guinea, Ghana, Guinea-Bissau, Ireland, Mauritania, and many others. Now, Royal Air Maroc says it is increasing its European network during the 2023 season. According to the airline, the carrier is opening a new route from Tangier to London Gatwick. Flights will start on June the 24th, operating twice a week through September the 2nd. Alongside the London launch, Royal Air Maroc is reinstating service from Tangier to Barcelona and Madrid this summer. And that's it on Business Incorporated. I'm Willie Wong. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow for another edition.